good. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Okay. All right, jump your feet one more time. We're going to read the Word of God. Genesis 1. No, <laughs> ah, so funny. Okay, Philippians chapter 3. Man, this has been, this has just been eating at me for so long. I don't say hi, I've only not spoken for like. Forever. This has just been. You're gonna like it. Okay. So, Philippians chapter three, verse ten and eleven. Are you ready? Okay. Come up. Okay. Thank you. Here we go. Verse ten says this. I want to know Christ. And can we just stop right there? Just you know, mic drop and call it. I want to know Christ. Cool. I want to know Christ. And what we're going to do tonight, I, I, it's not going to be, it's going to be the total package. Okay? The total package. You don't even know. We're going to talk about one little word, and it's going to encompass the total package. Right? No, <laughs> that was terrible. I'm joking. Did you see that joke coming? Was that too obvious? Did you still laugh? It's okay. Okay, three of you left. A little bit of word, and, 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 uh, and, like the seven, seven, you know, and, and, I want to know Christ, and, say, I want to say, I want to know Christ, and, and, the power, power. of his resurrection, and, share with him, in the fellowship of, suffering, suffering, and, And the uh, what is that? I forget it. And, and to somehow, I always mess up the last part. And so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Right? See, I hope that's fine. It's fine. It's fine. So real quick, this is what it sounds like all together. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him. I miss this part all together. Becoming like Him in His death and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. God, you are so good, and you are so amazing, and you are just the total package, and, man, let's go on and on, but God, you are just so good, and, amen. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so, the total package, and, so, and, kind of, like, like nothing to do with my notes real quick, but, but what kept going through my mind was, was all this talk about how your generation, and I'm sure you've heard this before, your generation is, is the entitlement generation. It's, you know, if you've heard that before, you know, older people, like, they're so entitled, they think everything should just be handed to them. Have you heard any of this before? Okay, so it was said about my generation too, and that's fine. But can I tell you that that's a good thing? You want to be entitled when it comes to the presence of God. When if you, if you expect something to be given to you when you walk into the, the house of God, it's gonna be. That's a good thing, right? Okay, that's always a good thing. So, I want, this is what Paul said, I want, and, 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 and. A couple of ands. That's what he wants. That's what I want, and. You can't, you, can I tell you something, you, you already know. You can't, I mean, you, I'm you, bro. But you, the rest of us can't put an and at the end of a sentence. Right? That makes sense? You know, and implies that there's more to God. Good, bad, or ugly, it's coming. There's something coming. And that, that's going to lock on silence. But an and, and period, it just doesn't mean you just can't do it. So I want to know Christ and power and suffering and resurrection. And, you, know, you know, and is not or. Like those two words, they're not interchangeable, right? It's not, you know, you, you, can, you can put a little slash in there, and or, to, you know, do one of those weird statements, you know, and or, and if, and but statements. But you can't interchange and and or. Jesus is not all a car. You either get him and power and suffering and resurrection, or you don't. It's, it's and. It's just, it's just so you know. Or. You get it or you don't. 
So, yeah, we're going to move on. What is, what would be the greatest accomplishment of your life? Someone tell me. Making it to heaven. No. Okay, are you, like, as of right now, that, that will be a good one. Somebody tell me a difference. Somebody besides Antonio, who's yeah. Somebody tell me what the greatest accomplishment of your life is so far. So far, huh? What have you done that was that was kind of cool? You beat Morgan and you graduated high school. Yes. What else? I got into you. You got into bed. I said, I got you. Got it. Not, not me. I like dogs. Pass your driving test. Pass your. Dylan, you passed your driving test. Yeah, you did. What else? The greatest accomplishment of your life.
to develop his character. And we'll never get a clear picture of, oh, this is who Jesus is. Because if we did, then he wouldn't be God. Or we could get a new, fresh revelation of God every time we open the word. Because that's what his word does. That's why it's so important. That's why it's such a value to us as believers. We got his ways, his companionship, his nature, his character. Second goal is to be found in Christ. To have our, our identity so wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ that when people even think about us, they think about Jesus.
I think perspective is a powerful tool that God gives us. Perspective. Problems fade, problems like fade into the background through the rear view mirror of perspective. Think about a little ant crawling along the ground. They come up to a blade of grass that looks like the Eiffel Tower or Mount Everest. But to us who are not an ant, we look down and don't even see the ant. Just keep going. Step on it. But your perspective really kind of defines your outlook on life. That's what perspective is, your, your outlook, right? Your, the, the angle that you look at life, the filter that you see your life through. This is what your perspective is. His ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Have you ever heard that before? Okay. That's because his perspective is coming from an eternal standpoint where ours can only see vapor that we have right now. It's just, just a little bit. It's just, it's gone. But eternity has a different view, view on it. It's a different standpoint. So, do we know that, that he knows what's best for us? I, I try to know that. So, so often I try to know that. Um, but it escapes me. There, there's a disconnect between here and here. My heart and my head is just there's something that, that, that blocks the, the knowing from the knower. Does that make sense? So, so whenever you've got whenever you've got something that you need to know, but it's just stuck in here, I know it, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is just me and Cecilia, but it takes me saying things out loud repetitively for it to get stuck. For it to get, I, I say stuck, for it to get into my know, into where nothing is going to shape what I know. I know that he knows what's best for me. And so if that's true, if the author of all things has our life, our, our God-given destiny, our life's purpose planned out, why would we ever get upset or anxious or, or, or discouraged because something doesn't work our way? That doesn't make any sense to me. I think about it, though. Think about your, your very first boyfriend or girlfriend. If they're sitting beside you, we'll look back on this later and, and we can laugh together. But think about it. If things would have worked out exactly how I planned, that would have been terrible. I mean, they were crazy. Just, right? <laughs> Pray, Pray, come on. Preach it. I'm so glad that he's God and I'm not. So glad. Because of the power that he has from his perspective said, dude, you should have left a long time ago. I'm like, yeah. No, come on, son. Man. The power, the purpose of the power is perspective, it's provision. Provision is, is well, it's this. Philippians 4, 19, my God shall supply all of your needs. All, say all. all. Come on, come on, say all. All of your needs according to his riches and glory. Jesus said it like this in Matthew, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then glass over that level over again. Seek first the kingdom of God and
psalmist said it like this, for zeal for your house consumes me. Zeal means passion. Passion for your house consumes me. Consumes me. Passion for your presence consumes me. Passion for your promise consumes me. Passion for your people consumes me. The purpose of the power that God has given us is for perspective, provision, and passion. Do you want to live life as a passionless person? I think the apathy, sorry, uh, I'm switching gears. That's another thing. The apathy of our culture is going to, it's going to destroy passion. All passion. Because it's not cool to be passionate about anything. So what? Zeal for your house has consumed me. Y'all remember, I know I'm trying to remember, death and Mr. 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 You remember that? That was amazing. We tried to kill Appy and still that stupid lady sneaks back in. Oh, I don't care. Okay. Yeah, I, I remember what God did for me. And I remember I remember what it's like to be in the presence of God. But, you know, it's not, that's not what my friends are doing. So. I almost don't need to hurt some of your feelings, but that's what the word of God is, son. Passion for your presence. I'm not sorry. Your God-given destiny will always be directly related to the passion of your pursuit. If you're not pursuing, if what, if what you are pursuing is not related to what God wants you to do, your passion is pointless. But if God has you perfectly set up to pursue something is going to grow. The consuming fire is going to get bigger. Those around you are going to they're going to, they're getting convicted by, by your passion. They're going to make you feel bad because they feel bad about themselves and not having any passion. Passion for your house consumes you. Passion for your presence. Passion. Provision. Respect. It's the power. It's the purpose of the power. And, and, and Luke is so, so perfect when he, when he writes this. In Acts 1, you've heard this a thousand times. But you will receive uh, what? Uh, uh, can't say more. Come on. But you will receive uh, <laughs> But you will receive uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my wit you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in, in Oklahoma, in Wainwright, in Dakota, in Warner, in Muskogee, in Fort Gibson, and to the very end of the earth. Did I forget somewhere? It's fine. You will be, you see, you already have the power within you. You already have it. It's already there. The moment you say, Jesus, I need you, you're inundated. Because the Holy Spirit, as part of the Trinity, comes along with Jesus. It's not an all a cart, it's an all or nothing. Y'all got that, we're still all together, right? So the Holy Spirit is immediately infilled in you. And you know, you know the purpose of this power? Most of you are not going to like this. You ready? The purpose of the power, you will receive my off. Or is just turning way down? Oh, I, I'm a, I got a red bottom. <laughs> but you will receive power. <laughs> you will receive power. It's not even green anymore. You will receive power uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness. You know what the purpose of that power is? <sighs> okay. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness. What's the purpose of that power? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness. What's the purpose of that specific power? Spread the gospel. I'm proud of you, Dale. The purpose, the purpose of the power is to make Jesus known. That's it. To take Jesus where he's not known. To tell about Jesus to those who may be 
know him but don't know him. The purpose of all power is to bring glory to Jesus. Not to, not of yourselves. Now God may use you to walk across water and lead 5,000 to, to a grandiose meal, but if he doesn't, if he does, then, then the glory needs to be to God. The power is not for you. It's through you. Does that make sense? The power... Okay. Sorry, I told you. Whew. Okay. Moving on. It's like... <laughs> it works! <laughs> it's alive. It's a battery. That's great. Um, so... <laughs> God. <laughs> oh, so the the, the you, you may have to turn me right out. I'm, I feel like good or not. Yeah. Uh, okay. So think about it like this: the power. Is it, is it too hot on me now? It doesn't matter. You're gonna get some Jesus tonight. <laughs> the power is is like think think about like your physical body. Okay. I haven't Dale. I just don't the video. I haven't ran in four weeks. I'm not going out this weekend to run 100 miles. I know, losing. Dale was running the next day after he ran 100 because, you know, he's Dale and I'm not. Um, but it's not like I don't physically have the, the ability to, to, to go out and run right now. Not 100 miles, but I do. But it would take a little bit. It takes some use. takes some structured training to get back to the point where I could run that far is insane. But I could. So can any of you. If you put in the time and the effort, if you work out, you can you can accomplish any physical goal. It's just a matter of training and discipline. Spiritual muscles. Let me give you some good news, okay? For all of you like uh, cardio. I ain't doing that. Okay. Spiritual muscles, they don't just disappear. They are always at work inside you. Always, always, always. Paul told Timothy to stir up, fan into flame the gifts that are within you. Fan them into flame. That means they're still there. They might just be a little ember. But unlike physical exercise, spiritual exercise only takes one encounter with God to get back to the right place where you just were. Just one encounter with God can drastically change your whole life. Why? Because that's the purpose of the power, to bring glory to God and make Jesus known. The purpose of the power. I want to know Christ, and I want to know his power. Say power. 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 And, say and. And. We're going to get to the total package here. Say and. And. See, I don't like when Paul does these things because he's like, I want to know Christ. Yes. I want to know power. Yes. I want to know suffering. Bro, come on. Let me just get like one book of the Bible that's all about the joy of the Lord. But you don't get that. You get, you can know Christ. You can know his power. In addition to that, you get to know his suffering. Isn't that so good? And, and the way it's worded is just like, Maybe it won't be so bad. And the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. Mm. Ain't that nice? Now, I don't want any part of that. Is it okay that I just tell you? I don't want any part of that. I don't want to suffer. <laughs> is that my is that my uh, flesh speaking a little too much? Probably. But that's just me. I don't want to hurt. I don't enjoy physical pain. I don't enjoy emotional pain. I, that's just me. I don't know. Maybe you're different. The fellowship, sharing, suffering. Okay, let's look at this. Let's, let's look at just, just for a minute. Okay, what's the significance of suffering? Is there one? Yes. Wait, just, yes, thank you. I'm glad, yes. Participation, yes. If we suffer, 2 Timothy 2.12, if we suffer, we shall also reign. Be kings. If we suffer, we will also reign. We're guaranteed a cross on our back right here. 
Guaranteed it. If you follow Christ, you get to pick up a cross and carry it every day. That's what you get. I debated whether whether I should share a little bit of advice with you um, and, and take this advice as, as you will. Uh, it's not meant to deter you in any way, but it's simply meant to encourage you and give you just a, a blink outright. This is what life looks like for a follower of Christ. The moment that that you accept Christ into your life doesn't necesarily shake you. It doesn't necessarily scare you. Lots of people, lots of Christians that have accepted Christ that's it. Complacency? Fine. Perfectly fine. You're not doing anything for the kingdom of God, you probably won't do that. If you say, Jesus, I'm in my life, you're my sins, I love you, again, and then do nothing, you're probably going to be okay. You probably get to avoid this particular section of this verse, the whole suffering part. Why that is, you're not scaring anybody. The moment that you begin to do something for Jesus, like use the power for its particular purpose. You've got a big old bullseye right in your chest. Right on those around you, those who love you most, those who you love. They're all targets now. This is part of the cross that we get to carry each and every day. If you take that advice and just, just think about it for, for just a little bit, we'll move on. You can think about it. If focus here right now, you can think about that advice. We're guaranteed a cross on our back in this life, but a crown of life for eternity. It's not a very difficult trade-off. Well, so for, you know, what's the average now? 73 years uh, for men? Something like that? It's not very much. Uh, what about dog years? I'm just kidding. Um, 73, sorry. 73-ish years for a guy uh, to live versus, you know, eternity. I can carry something for 73 years. Maybe that's just me. Uh, maybe that's too prideful. But we've got some assurance. Jesus said in, in, in the book of John, is recorded saying this, in this world, you will have trouble. Amen and glory. Hallelujah. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Before, before he did it, he had already done it. That makes sense. Before he, when he said this, he had already overcome the world. He hadn't died and rose again or anything yet, but he had already overcome the world. The significance of suffering, man, James puts it so good. It says, it says like this, I, I love, love to hate this verse. James 1, 2 through 4, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work. Let me make sure I get this right. Perseverance must, must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What's the significance of suffering? So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Word of God also says that you lack something, ask them. You have nothing to do. Ask them. Suffering develops character. We want God to use us. If we complain when we get used, dude, come on. God is so good at mapping out our lives. Now let me say something real, real quick. God does not cause us to suffer. He does not bring suffering on us, but he does not waste anything that is brought to us. Does that make sense? He does not waste it. He builds us up through it. The Word of God says, uh, somewhere, uh, I'm forgetting the reference, what God meant for your, or what Satan meant for your harm, God turns for your good. So when we have to face trials of many kind, it's for our good. And we can count in joy. We can stare that problem, that issue, that, that, that relationship in the face and say, you know what? This is all going to make us strong. This is only going to help develop who I am in Christ. Because I want to know Christ and be known by Him. I want the defining characteristic, you know, 
suffering develops character. I want the defining characteristic of my life to be Christ. The presence of God. The, the, the value difference on, on things that are earned versus things that are just given is drastic. Y'all you know, you know, understand what I'm talking about, right? It's like if, if I just gave you a car versus you have it both done. It's, it's, if I gave you a car versus if you worked your butt off and then you paid for a car yourself. Even though the car that you paid for yourself is going to be a lot worse than the nice one I'm giving you because, you know, you passed your own thing. Um, yeah, you all laugh at that? Come on! Um, <laughs> the difference in the value that you would put in a car that you worked for would be way different. You would care for it more. You would, you would make sure it's, it's all waxed and buffed out. No scratches on it that, that weren't there uh, before you got it. Um, you care for things that you earn. But things that are given are often taken advantage of. The significance of suffering is that we're developed into mature Christians. We're developed into completeness through suffering. And it's so much easier, so much easier to just talk about it, to preach about it, and actually walk through it. But if I can be a little bit open with you guys, through the through the run for the nations um, time. Training the, the regular training and through the actual weekend, the night it was an absolute nightmare. We had we had issues flogging our family left and right. And it's because we decided to do something for Jesus. We have issues up here that I don't even think any of you guys know about. Why? Because we were doing something for Jesus. The significance of suffering is that something gets done. The significance of suffering is that Jesus gets made known. See, it all goes back to Jesus. Every, this, this whole verse comes full circle. Because this last, this last part says here, number 11, and say and. and. So somehow to attain the resurrection from how do I do that? It's simple. You love Jesus. You let Jesus love you. You love God's people. You let God's people love you. You share life with you. And if your life is focused on the one who created life, you're good. The word of God says it like this. First Thessalonians 4. I'm going to read a bunch of verses here starting in 13. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of the men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and... Don't you love that silly little word? Say, and... and. Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Uh, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be with the Lord forever. again to be better next time to, to achieve a better level of life in the next one. Not anything goofy like that. It's the simple fact that we get to spend eternity with Jesus. And the 
moment, in the twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ, those who have those who serve Christ and die, the dead in Christ will rise. And then we who are left, that means in the moment the rapture takes place, just, just a little information for you. The moment the rapture takes place, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then us who are left will meet, who love God, will meet them in the air. Eternity with Jesus. Face to face with the Savior of the world. Breathing in as he breathes out. Come on, little talk. Come on, sit at his feet. When we get that chance for eternity, this is the hope of the world. The completion of joy. So it's vital. It's absolutely vital. And can, can, I, can I, buddy, can you play that? Remember that song? Yeah. Can you do that for us? You guys can do that. It's vital that we know Christ, know his power, share in his suffering, share in the resurrection. It's the total package. It's not, it's, it's, it's not, it's not a pick and choose. It's all or nothing. It's vital that we know that. Because once we once we get to that point, we become total package. Not anything arrogant. But we do. We become the total package. We know Christ. We know his power. We know his suffering. And we know his resurrection. You have to know Jesus to present Jesus. You have to know his power to present his plan, which is salvation to everyone. You have to know uh, you have to know his suffering so the significance stands out. And you have to know that the resurrection is a real thing. So that, so that his glory can be revealed. This life and death and eternity that sits in the palm of our hand and right in front of our faces. purpose of the power that you have? Ask God to tell you. He'll tell you to go to his word. And he'll tell you again. You know the significance of your suffering? Ask God to point it out. You want to know why we Christians get so hyped about the resurrection? Because it's a real stinking thing. It's about to happen. God's heartbeat is, is echoed in, in, in 2 Peter 3 9. It says, God is not willing that any should perish. I've heard you say that before. If you can hear the heartbeat in it, can you hear it? Should perish. 